Welcome to ITC Presents Swabiman Bharat, a Network 18 initiative. I'm Ridhu Bhandari. The last one year has perhaps been the most transformative for enterprises around the world. Companies have had to innovate on products, on services, on processes, and even on business models to really survive the pandemic. And only those with the maximum agility, flexibility, high innovation, and tremendous resilience have been able to successfully ride out the storm so far. So our focus today is on pivoting amidst the pandemic. And I'm joined today by Keshav Pajanka, Executive Director of Century Ply, Ashok Segal, Co-Chairman, CII National MSME Council and Managing Director of Frontier Technologies, and Rajendra Joshi, CEO of Residential at Brigade Group. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Well, the pandemic has really forced many businesses around the world to pivot in order to stay relevant. So let me first begin by asking each of you what your companies have been doing and how have you all been innovating over the last uh, one year or so. Ashok, if I may begin with you, at Frontier Technologies, how was business really impacted by the pandemic? How have you innovated on the product front, on the process front? Uh, you know, how have you managed demand and supply over the last one year or so? It was a very challenging time. And as uh, many people have said, this is something which is a new natural, which we all had to adapt to. The initial period of the lockdown was really very difficult because we had to meet expenses of our staff and workers with very little income coming in. And particularly the timing was bad because the last few weeks of the Financial year are always times for a lot of shipments and a lot of payments to be made by suppliers. So that was a problem for the lockdown period of about three months. But thereafter, we were able to come back in about another four to six weeks. And I think most MSMEs have been able to recover and adapt to this new normal that people talk about. And I think going forward, we're all very hopeful that things will not be as bad as it looked when the whole thing started. And we are well on the way to recovery. Good to hear that optimism from you, Mr. Segal. Uh, let me also bring in Rajendra Joshi. The past one year has been particularly tough for the real estate segment. Uh, give us a sense of, you know, what sort of an impact did the initial months of the lockdown have, particularly on your business, your business operations? Uh, how did you manage and how have you managed to stay agile through the last one year? The pandemic did really cause a huge disruption in the real estate business uh, because uh, real estate is essentially a brick and mortar business. Our customers come to sites, buy their homes. Um, our construction uh, happens absolutely on site. And therefore, in the first few months of the pandemic, particularly the first two months of the pandemic, uh, we had to completely uh, reorganize our uh, business model uh, because in the residential business particularly, the customers come to sites to visit to see how the uh, work is happening, what is uh, there in the uh, show apartments, uh, to experience the product. Only then would they buy because this would be one of their largest investments in their life. This had to completely stop. So we had to switch to a new normal in terms of interacting with customers through video calls, how to explain the product to them uh, through a virtual video tours of our uh, show apartments of our project, how to train our salespeople in order to how to explain the uh, product to the customers. So all of this was uh, a really a challenging experience. In the first quarter, our business uh, fell by almost 60%. We had only about 35, 40% of our quarter-on-quarter uh, quarter number that we had experienced in the uh, previous year. But we did quite a few things, including how to enable the customer visit the sites virtually, experience the product, and do the booking uh, online, including signing the application forms, paying the money, etc. So all of that was done in order to ensure that the bookings continue despite uh, the hit of the pandemic. It was a tough time, but I think all of us worked to ensure that the customer had a fairly good experience of the product and uh, it, it really, uh, the digital uh, platforms really helped us uh, during the pandemic. 
Right, absolutely. It's been an innovative year for everyone. And uh, Keshav, what about you? You innovated on the product front with your ViroKill technology. How successful has that move been? In fact, uh, you even joined hands with CNBC TV 18 to create a virus-free television news studio. And I've got to say that that's a pretty innovative move. Uh, but aside from the innovation, how difficult was it to really strategize, to put in the investment and really launch a new product at this scale and speed uh, during the pandemic so ritu i think you've already hit the nail on its head you know it was extremely challenging it was extremely difficult but um, with a team as strong as we have with partners such as yourself who are willing to innovate willing to to you know walk hand in hand with us we were able to roll out an initiative that we thought was was impossible to roll out in that time frame um, we actually came up with virokill in the month of april and as you know April was one of the most challenging months. That was when the lockdown was in full effect. And our factory team actually worked really, really hard. They were able to, to, to successfully develop this technology, post which our marketing team was able to come up with a communication strategy in a month, which normally takes us six months. So I think that it was an extremely challenging but extremely fulfilling time for us. It was a product launch that taught us that we can work at a great pace, at a pace faster than what we are used to. Um, I think the company's balance sheet and the fact that, you know, uh, we are uh, practically a zero debt company helped a lot because that meant that financially we had all the resources that were required. But um, uh, to be honest, I had my doubts initially whether we would be able to launch uh, Virokill in that short time span. And by the grace of God, we were able to. Right. Okay, absolutely. Uh, Mr. Segal, as far as the MSME segment is concerned, digital technology adoption has been accelerated for them as well. What are some of the big challenges that MSMEs have faced in this time to really quickly adopt digital technologies or scale up the technologies that they had already adopted? Uh, you know, and how have some of them really leveraged technology innovatively in order to stay afloat during this tough year? Uh, there, are, there are two things... Uh which I would like to talk about in this video. First is the problem created by migrant workers not being available. I think it has forced MSMEs more than anybody else to look at innovative technologies which will improve productivity and involve less human interaction. Now, there is a question of whether this is good in terms of overall employment numbers, but I think the fact that there have been recent complaints of a shortage of workers shows that workers who have gone back are happier to be back in their village and the industry is managing without them. So I think that's a win-win situation rather than people crying over the fact of the shortage of workers. And that is definitely something which has been helpful. The other thing is the use of uh, digital interaction with your financial institutions. On one level, we were able to organize a digital, a digital interaction where we had uh, something like 1,500 applicants for bank loans come online and approach a consortium, a, a, a grouping of 25 or 30 banks to whom they could interact over a one week, what we call a money mobilization week. So it showed people that look, you you can apply for loans online and have all you provided you have all your data. So when we talk of MSMEs being in the non-organized sector, I think these have been tremendous incentives for MSMEs to think of the advantages of coming into the organized sector, being counted, being visible, submitting your data, both to your lenders and the government and enabling the MSME sector as a whole to be responded to in the way in which they need. So I think these are two of the very big uh, benefits of the limitation on physical restriction and the use of technology to reach out. Right. Okay. Well, uh, Keshav, would you say that the size of your company was also very advantageous to you, especially for launching a new product, uh, you know, in these times? This is a product that was based on nanotechnology. You launched it during the lockdown. How did technology really play a pivotal role in helping this launch? And would you say that now in the future, you will have a continued focus on nanotechnology based products and innovate more on that front? I think we need to take this in two facets, you know, uh, on the one hand, the size of the company makes it far easier to, to launch things due to the fact that we have the financial resources to, to bring about that launch. But having, for instance, in the case of Virokill, you know, we had the, the marketing team, we had the, the factory team, we had uh, the resources to put, to put the message out. So that made it 
much easier to launch a new technology. Having said that, um, when you look at the other end of the spectrum, when you look at changes to the way we operate, changes to the culture of the business, that is one area where the larger the size of the company is, the more difficult it is to cause those changes. For instance, we were trying to roll out a Salesforce automation app for two years prior to the pandemic. But we were always unsuccessful because there's a lot of resistance internally. People were not willing to change. During the course of the pandemic, because there was no sale, it was far easier to roll out a Salesforce automation tool. So I think it is a double-edged sword. But yes, when it comes to new launches, new developments, I think the size of the company has really helped us to, to, uh, to develop and to, to get our product to market fast. Right. Well, good to hear that. Uh, indeed, I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic has been that uh, it has given all of you time to really think and innovate. The lockdowns were perhaps a boon in that sense. Uh, and on that note, let's head into a short break right now. But the conversation on pivoting amidst the pandemic continues right here on the other side. Stay with us. Welcome back to ITC Presents Swabhiman Bharat, a Network 18 initiative. Today we are talking about pivoting amidst the pandemic because it is enterprises who have been able to transform their products, their services, their business models and have stayed agile through the last one year that have been perhaps able to beat the pandemic so far. Mr. Segal, what is that going to mean for the MSME sector? It is perhaps the hardest hit by the pandemic what is the road to recovery looking like right now? And have you seen significant emergence of innovative products and services from small businesses uh, or significant transformations in their business models? Definitely. I think as uh, Kesha mentioned, uh, the pause in the speed of day-to-day -day activities gave time to step back and carry through to fruition and implementation various ideas that were there in people's minds. Now, this ranged for instance, in our specific instance, to two or three product innovations that we had in mind, we were able to complete the development of that because the day-to-day -day production pressures were not there. The production facilities, unlike large units, uh, our development is done on the production machines. We don't have a separate R&D department which can, or a laboratory that can make the innovations and test them out. So we have to divert from the day-to-day -day production. And the slowdown in that, or the gap which was created in the production facilities enabled us to do that. So that was one thing. Similarly, in the churning of, on, the, on a softer side, we had been wanting to implement an ERP package, uh, which had been a desire for a long time. And, as, and we realized that we do have time to move and think more in that. So we have not implemented it, but we have begun the journey. We have identified a vendor and a party who can help us along that way. And we have started on that process. I'm sure that uh, going ahead three or four, uh, six months from now, we will be using that very effectively. One of the immediate results we've seen from the thinking which is generated by that is that our inventory levels today are about 25 to 30% less than they were in the usual times. And yet we are able to continue our normal business operations with far more efficiency with far less blockage of inventory and much more efficient uh, and continuous production without stoppages due to mismatch of availability of materials and the production that is required. So instead of making to an as estimated demand, we are now able to make two actual orders as they come in and respond to that requirement in a time frame which is acceptable to the end customer. So by making two order, we have not elongated our production cycle time so that the end customer is not seeing any delay. But we are seeing the benefit of that, of having faster delivery cycles, which is encouraging us to think of increasing volumes without massive new investments in plant and machinery and hard goods in the coming year. And I think that a lot of MSMEs are now realizing that they have managed with lesser resources and there are ways to do that. And it is advantageous to everybody to walk along that path. 
let's also shift focus a little bit on the whole Atmanirbhar Bharat scheme uh, and the larger dream for India that the government has. Keshav, beyond the resilience and the pivots that India Inc. has really shown over the last one year, what will it really take for us to become truly self-reliant or Atmanirbhar and also to become a global destination for manufacturing? Uh, do you have a wish list for the government? Yes, I definitely do. But um, I would like to say first that, uh, you know, the journey has started. If you look at uh, Century, for instance, um, there are a lot of items that prior to pandemic, we weren't manufacturing in India. And, um, you know, as people have, as uh, Mr. Stegel said, that there is there is already a, a, a disruption that is caused because during the pandemic period, you weren't able to import certain things, you weren't able to get deliveries, you weren't able... To, to, rely, to have reliable international vendors because the, the supply chain across the world was, was disrupted. So I think that um, a lot of items have scope, a lot of items that we have been importing have the scope to be manufactured in India. Some of them we are manufacturing in-house. A lot of others where we are facing issues, importing raw material, importing uh, some, some spares and stores, we have now got Indian vendors who are actually cheaper but it was just that earlier we did not know that they existed or earlier the supply chain infrastructure was such that you would not look uh, other than the original supplier. Going forward, I think that definitely there are some things that we need to do. You know, if you look at other countries, the rate of interest is perhaps still lower than us. I know that we have reduced our interest rates for the past few years. But still, if you compare us to certain other developing countries, I think we have higher rates of interest. I think that in terms of licenses and in terms of other other permissions that are required to start business, there are still certain uh, certain disadvantages that we have in India compared to other countries. And lastly, the cost of land in India and the process of getting land is far more difficult. So I think if we can bring about these few changes, if the government can actively take these up, then the, the road to Atman Nirbhar Bharat suddenly looks much easier. Right, absolutely. Uh, Rajendra, would you like to add on to that wish list for the government that Keshav just mentioned? Uh, and also, what has the big COVID-19 opportunity been uh, for the real estate sector at large? And what transformations do you foresee in the new normal in the post-COVID-19 world? So in terms of the wish list, uh, I just want to add one thing, uh, which is uh, from uh, 1st April 2019, uh, the government of India has withdrawn the input tax credit on the real estate. So when we sell and when you collect the tax, you used to get a set off on what we were paying tax on the input materials. That's been withdrawn. That has actually pushed up the prices for the end customer. So if government can look at that, that's one, our big wish list. Second is cement, which is a key ingredient for not only for us, for the entire infrastructure is taxed at 28%, a luxury tax. Cement is certainly not a luxury item. So we would like the government to look at this and probably rationalize the duty on cement. These are the two big uh, requests that we have from uh, the government. The way the business is transforming, even before pandemic, but particularly during the pandemic in the real estate, uh, in the residential real estate, is that there is a huge brand consolidation that's happening. Uh, therefore, most customers are now looking to buy their houses from large uh, established uh, players and therefore the market share of large players like us uh, uh, in larger cities is going up uh, and that's the trend that i see there is clearly a demand for larger houses integrated communities where you have a place to stay a place to work a place for your children to study with a hospital uh, and probably uh, some amount of retail around. I think that would be the trend for the future with a contained uh, work, work environment where you don't have to spend hours on uh, commute. I think that's the two clear trends I see, brand consolidation and uh, larger integrated communities uh, where people would like to live, work, learn and play. Uh, all of you in your own way are contributing to the whole Atmanirbhar Bharat dream of the government. Uh, Mr. Segal, the MSME sector is crucial for this dream to really take off in India. Give us a sense of how MSMEs can really increase their own competitiveness uh, and play a much larger role in the global supply chains in the future. Yeah, I think MSMEs have taken uh, very definite steps to become uh, 
self-reliant within India. And I think particularly a lot of MSMEs are facing competition from low price, low quality imports of products which could very well be made in India. Now, with the restrictions being put on cross-border trade with our what we call our uh, neighboring countries, land, land sharing uh, countries, there has been a pickup in the demand for products made by MSMEs, both due to patriotic reasons. And then once it begins due to patriotic reasons, the buyer realizes that there is no reason not to make this standard business practice. It makes economic sense for him. It makes technical sense for him. And we, uh, through another organization, which I'm involved with, we organized a very uh, interesting session with BHEL, which put together a list of 100 items which they're buying. And what is the specification to which they're buying? What is the value of purchases every year? And they're encouraging MSMEs to come forward and say, we can make this and we can offer this. Again, in our particular instance, we had a very, very low import content of uh, under 10%. But even so, we decided to move forward with more indigenization or at least variety of uh, suppliers, vendors throughout the world. And we were able to find better quality products at maybe marginally higher prices. But when your import content is 10 percent, if you get a better supplier with a better quality and better delivery at, let us say, a 10 percent higher price, that makes an impact of not more than 1 percent on your overall cost. Or, or and 1% in your price, which I think is a very affordable trade-off, which is something one did never thought of. But now that is being adequately thought of. And some of the larger companies are now looking at finding that they must develop local vendors for items which they found very easy, particularly multinationals, to import from their global supply chain. And they've been actively looking at why they should not source from India. The issues like shortage of shipping containers, increase in freight rates, all that is helping tremendously in having the larger companies look at MSMEs who are the next level down as potential vendors for them, rather than finding the easy way out of going to the vendors who are supplying their international companies from other countries. So I think this is a very, very good as, uh, opportunity for Indian MSMEs, and we have to take advantage, and we are taking advantage. Absolutely. Innovation, efficiency, agility, all have been crucial to surviving of what has been one of the most uh, tough years of our lives. Gentlemen, thank you very much for sharing your very, very valuable insights and experiences today on Swabhiman Bharat. Good luck to each of you for the future. With that, it's a wrap of this special conversation. News and updates continue on Network 18. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye.